So they came off the production line, scooter back at 173. This is a issue. Like they tested them here. Yeah. To fully understand the evolution of great defensive lines and forts, and to understand the evolution of the Second World War, we need to look at the historic parallels from the annexation of Austria and the Sudetenland, and the defensive principles and constructions of the Maginot Line and the Czech defensive line in the Sudetenland. To fully understand the evolution of great defensive lines and forts, and to understand the evolution of the Second World War, we need to look at the historic parallels from the annexation of Austria and the Sudetenland, and the defensive principles and constructions of the Maginot Line and the Czech defensive line in the Sudetenland. But before we go through some of these amazing restored Czech bunkers, and go over their designs and the concepts of their battle plans, and later even the sites of testing of one of the most secret German weapons as well. Let's start with the beginning, with a little history. We have always heard that it was Hitler's aggression and coercion and outright invasions that annexed Austria and later Sudetenland and eventually all of Czechoslovakia. But is it really that black and white? To understand the situation leading to the Czech building forts facing Germany starting hundreds of years before, already in 1866, Austria proposed a greater German Union, uniting all German-speaking regions and countries. With the Austrians, of course, in the high seat, and the Prussians taking second-place position in this empire. This did not sit well with the Prussians, and as most things in Europe, it eventually led to a small war, the Austria-Prussian War in 1866. When it came to an end, with the Prussians defeating the Austrians, and excluding the Austrian Empire from that of the Greater Germanic Union, the Prussian statesman Otto von Bismarck then formed the North German Confederation, which included most of the remaining German states. But inside Austria, a large percentage of people continued to want a unification of sorts with Germany. The other side led to the Austrian-Hungarian Compromise of 1867, which provided for dual sovereignty. The Austrian Empire and the Kingdom of Hungary united under Franz Josef I. Still, many Austrians were pro-German and continued to show loyalty to Bismarck, even if they were cracked down upon by the Austrian government. This division would continue within Europe until 1945. Fast forwarding, after World War I had ended, and the full terms of the Treaty of Versailles became known. And with it, Austria would lose 40% of its pre-World War I territories, including its most fertile lands, leading, of course, to a resurgence of the Austrian popular wish to be united with Germany. Some Austrian territories, such as Salzburg and Tyrol, even held plebsites, with over 90% wanting to join Germany. However, by a stroke of a pen, the Allies forbade the Austrians from joining with Germany, and no more plebsites were held. Contrary to Wilson's promise of self-determination of nations and peoples. In 1931, Austria openly entertained a union with Germany. However, regional patriotism were stronger in some of these regions, so then it came to nothing. But clearly, there was still a great pro-German sentiment. That clashed with the Austrian government, who now cracked down harshly on any supporters of a greater Germany. This would lead the Austrian-born Hitler, once he was in power, of beginning his initiatives to incorporate Austrian territories one way or another, it began to take place. This started by supporting the pro-German sentiments and fractions within Austria. Similar situations occurred in what became known as Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. The Sudetenland term can be tracked back to the Thirty Year War, wherein Bohemia lost 70% of its population. And after the Bohemian Revolt in 1620, the Habsburgs gradually began to integrate the Kingdom of Bohemia into their monarchy. And after those areas less populated were resettled with German Catholics from Austria 
and gradually in these area German culture and language became the primary and official language while Czech declined to a secondary role in the empire. Of course conflicts between the Czechs and German nationalists emerged in the 19th century. For instance in the revolution of 1848 where the German speaking population of Bohemia and Moravia wanted to participate in the building of the German nation state the Czech speaking population insisted on keeping Bohemia out of such plans. The Bohemian Kingdom remained a part of the Austrian Hungarian Empire until its dismemberment after World War I. This here left the borderlands with a large population of German speakers in what then became known as Sudetenland. In October 1918 a sovereign Czech state was established. The German deputies of Bohemia, Moravia and Silesia in the Imperial Council Reichard, referred to the 14 points of US President Woodrow Wilson and the rights proposed therein of self-determination and attempted to negotiate the union of the German-speaking territories with the new Republic of Germany and Austria, which itself aimed at joining Weimar Germany. On 20 September 1918, the Prague government asked the opinion of the United States about the Sudetenland. Wilson sent Ambassador Archibald Coolidge into Czechoslovakia. Coolidge insisted on respecting the Germans' right to self-determination and uniting all German-speaking areas, which either were within Germany or Austria, with the exception of northern Bohemia. However, the American delegation at the Paris talks did not follow Coolidge's proposal, despite some areas were almost 90% German. Indeed, all of Czechoslovakia was a total of 24% German speakers. Thus, the lines were drawn up long ago, and once Hitler took power and set the wheels in motion for an Anschluss with Austria, it became clear to the Czechs that their territories would be next. Granted, Germany did tacitly support a pro-Nazi coup in Austria and later did have a pro-German instigators active in Sudetenland. However, it does seem clear that in both places there was a majority in favor of joining with Germany. And after the Anschluss with Austria and the referendum subsequently, the Czechs started to construct a defensive line facing the most likely places of a German invasion. Now it must be said that Hermann Göring was actively communicating with the Czech government promising that there was no concern for an invasion of Czechoslovakia and a 10 km demarcation zone was established and it seems Göring was quite honest in his diplomatic efforts to both Czechoslovakia and Poland. However, he was slipping in his grip on Hitler's ambitions and on the other hand, both the Polish and the Czechs were reaching out for help or promises of support to both France and Britain. Both promises were given of military support and this shaped the Czech defensive constructions and tactics. It was envisaged that the Germans would attack in a large pincer movement on both flanks of the country, thereby encircling the main Czech defenses. Then they would attack frontally, where the Czech army would gradually pull backwards to pre-constructed defensive lines and holding on until the French arrived. That was the plan anyway. And the Czech fortified lines were formidable. It was to some degree inspired by the older Maginot line, but upgraded and with lessons learned. Several lines were constructed with smaller forts on a string focusing on flanking defensive fire to the sides, where the fields were covered by obstacles, mines and barbed wire and behind them a large artillery force would be set up and be the main punch against an attacking enemy. These forts were very well constructed, self-contained and protected, and in the best strategic locations blocking obvious routes of advance. And these are slowly now being restored by a great bunch of volunteers and you have to see what they have done here because it truly is amazing.
it is an incredibly well placed fortification you are right on top of the hill overlooking pretty much every avenue of advance from the enemy with steel domes built with little back support I am in the former Czechoslovakia and I'm looking at the defensive line that was built they built thousands of fighting positions all around three quarters of the border of Czechoslovakia leading up to 1938 anticipating a war of invasion by Germany but what I really wanted to do was explore how the fortification was set up interlocking fields of fire like the Maginot Line and there were generals here advising from the Maginot Line so they have the resemblance of the late model Maginot Line forts the smaller more compact fighting forts tunnels connecting them interlocking fields of fire on top of hills great views it's a great defensive position that the Germans would have quite a bit of trouble getting through if the Czechs had not been ordered to go home and abandon them Oh, they did a wonderful job in here. So, how many people would be stationed here? Thirty-two people in two shifts. So they would work uh, twelve-hour shifts. Yeah. Okay. And this is all the original World War II equipment. Yes. So this is what it looked like. Wow, there's nothing in here back then. No, no, no. It was just uh, the walls and uh, not even the s like small walls built of bricks. Pro ně to je osobní, protože jeho rodina někdo pojď, aby věděli prostě jak vypadá český opevňovací systém. If Benish had not given in to Hitler and it had turned into a a, a fight, do you, does he think that these fortifications would have stopped? Uh, Hitler's army in 1938. He thinks they, it would because it was counted for 14 days uh, just to hold uh, the Germans uh, outside of the Czechoslovakia. We relied on uh, the French that uh, if they go for it and uh, would help us then uh, the Germans would uh, like give up. Of course we now know that the French nor the British had any intentions of actually coming to aid the Czech had it come to an all-out battle and invasion. This is, is it an inspiration of the the Bren gun? That uh, most of the guns of this uh, size are 7.92, uh, so that uh, they didn't have to store many many various uh, types of uh, the ammunition. Yeah. So you had food food for two weeks. Yes. And ammunition for. Uh, for two weeks, everything was uh, made for two weeks, and the fuel for the uh, say the generator. The engine, yeah, the generator. Oh, the military way of storing tools. Yeah. That hasn't changed <laughs> in all these years. Actually, it wasn't possible to get uh, the real one and the one from the times of uh, from the 1930s. So it's the same manufacturer and uh, almost the same engine. In fact, it was very very similar. We can show you. the ventilation room is uh, next to the doors. This polish. Yeah, and this is just uh, the ventilation for the exhausts. So that's opening the gas. Uh, cooling water. The cooling water. Okay. Yeah. That's opening the gas. Yeah. That's the gas. Non pomost. No, to pak bude This is just like a Harley Davidson. Have turn on the gas and then you have to talk to it and yell at it and then it'll start. And you have to grease all the This is to grease all the all the pistons, right? Sorry, this is to grease all the pistons and roll yeah. all the, get all the fluids moved around before you start it. Yeah. Yep. 
Just like how it is. Not at all. Bigger. <laughs> we haven't seen all of them. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I just hope mine will start when I get home. Anyway. Then. See, I knew he was going to bring matches. Sorry? I knew he was going to bring oh. out matches or, or something. Well, you have everything. Not matches. So for the... Talk me through this. These are, are these the spark plugs? <sighs> Knopf, yeah. No, but it's a I have to for a better ignition. Yes, let's screw the glowing things into the fuel. I have never seen an engine started by setting it on fire. I love it. I yes, that's a special procedure. This is very special. <laughs> and it's not even developed by the French, which is really strange. <laughs> charm of an old fishing boat or an old Harley standing outside sounding almost like an exhaust. I absolutely love the smell of diesel or gasoline. Diesel. So we'll love the smell of diesel in the morning. Seriously, being inside the small fighting compartment with a generator running, it wouldn't be fun. It would eventually get to you, but over the noise of battle, I see how you can ignore it for a while, but you got a little bit of vibration, even out here, the doors will be closed of course, now they're open, and you have the sleeping compartment right here, right next to the generator room. Standing here, in the sleeping compartment, next to the generator, with it running, you can feel the whole room is shaking. Just, just a little bit, just enough that it would really be hard to sleep if you had to have the generator running for a prolonged time. But what an amazing job they've done by restoring this whole fort to look exactly like it did and how amazing it is that they could find the original cannon. Just as an extra detail, there's a bolt arm that will lock on the door, even though the door springs out, to render support in case someone would put a charge on the outside of the door, it would not be flung back inside in here in the building. It is all about the details. 
and this is one of the details. It's like the whole bunker is vibrating a little bit just because of this. But what an amazing place. Independent, self-sustaining, water, perfect. Gas tight, yeah. air tight, yeah. over pressure, mm -hmm. over pressure, mm -hmm. tight. Gas. Gas. Here's Victor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Push gas tight, over pressure. This is for water. So there's a ground pump. There's groundwater. Yeah, this is the pump. Here we have the well, which is uh, 62.5 meters uh, deep. And all of these bunkers had their own ground well. Yeah, except for very, very few exceptions uh, in the whole republic. So they had to dig, dig, dig until they found the water. You have a radio. I can hear it. Oh, yeah. So, so we can just go on to this, uh, to the F uh, room. The F room. Yes. Ooh. The against the gas, pretty plenary, pretty plenary. Pretty plenary. Um, the air was taken from uh, outside uh, in this uh, near the entrance. I don't know if you uh, saw it, but yes. there, there is yeah, there, there is the place, there is the hole, and it went here. And uh, there is also uh, the filter uh, uh, against the dust in case of any attack. Uh, of uh, gas, so uh, this would be involved, uh, these filters, or it was also possible uh, not to involve the filters and uh, just uh, let the, the air flow uh, through. Yeah. Uh, so this is, a, this is coal, different different types of coal uh, and yes. filtering. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and also you, uh, you were able, or the, the soldiers were able to heat uh, this air if it was, uh, if it was cold and oh. it would be heated uh, from the from the water uh, that uh, uh, the ran through the generator. Yes. Oh, so there was actually central heating. Actually, yeah. Actually. <laughs> very, very, uh, yeah. When you get it going, it's not that bad. <laughs> But you know, this was a, an advantage because nobody could cut uh, the, the connection actually, not like... Yeah. The telephone line we have an armored wall, but we are below ground, right? Uh, yes, we are below ground now. What's that? Generator Pro. So the telegraph had its own little generator. Yeah. That was running from the main generator. Uh, this needed to have the direct, the, the DC, you know, like AC DC. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> I ride motorcycles. I know everything about AC DC. And that's the was the original was that here or did they rescue it somewhere? Uh, is it no? It wasn't definitely here because there were just plain walls. This is just made. Okay. The soldiers could be hit by uh, the fra fragments of, uh, I don't know, wires or uh, stuff. So there's two command, two commanders. Yes, yes. yes sir, so four, four of them. Yeah, but they changed.
Two one, uh, two one, two off, two one, two off. Yes. Wow, so there actually, but there was one commanding officer though. Uh, yes, right. the, the very head of the, of the bunker. And then uh, two, like lower, let's say. Yeah, and they also, also shared they bet, their bets. So the really yeah. commanding officer, the, the head of the bunker, was the other one who had, it, who has his, who had his own. Uh -huh. Yeah, so like this. You can get the water running. Yeah, yeah, we do. And you hold a good 500 liters or something like that. How many liters do you have? How many liters do you have? So this is uh, to communicate. Oh, so that's like, yeah, yeah you yell through. This is for the saliva. To so, really? Oh, so I get and it. And you just... <laughs> okay, I get it. That. <laughs> you yell... Okay. <laughs> Wouldn't it be easy just to put a filter on up there, but... Very nice. Yeah, so this is the to take away the smoke uh, from uh, the yeah. fire. So there's a, this a ventilation access pretty much anywhere, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. really yeah, yeah, that's true. Am I so missing a way? It starts being oh. even more interesting. So these are the two heavy machine guns which were produced in uh, Brno, the gun plant, let's say. So here are the two and uh, this is the light machine gun. Yeah. Yeah. Like so you could uh, navigate uh, yeah. the fire by Either looking through the. Uh, yep. And you have the. See, that's the one thing is I found interesting. Uh -huh. In all the forts, there's a uh, spent uh, casing. Mm -hmm. None of the German bunkers have that. Oh, really? I've never seen a German bunker with uh -huh. where the munition had anywhere to go. That's very clever. So they did a drawing yeah. that would follow the gun. So the gunner would have a rough idea uh -huh. of what he was looking at. Yeah, in case there was smoke. That's actually very, very, very smart. That I haven't seen before. Yeah, it's a, it's a Czechoslovak thing. It's a specific. I've seen it in cannon domes, but not, not for heavy machine guns. Uh -huh. That's very... Aha, it's so you actually have two of the original machine gun optics. Yeah. That's rare. I mean, did a good finding this stuff. It's not easy. Yeah. And there was a third way how they could communicate or how could they how they could navigate uh, the fire mm -hmm. because there are usual there are normally there are lights. Uh, Three or four there are. Four. Four, four, four lights and each of them has a different color and uh, they could communicate by switching off and on the combinations of uh, these lights and uh, they could communicate with the person in the cupola. Oh, so there would be a signal light for the... For the... Oh, what is he talking about? No, no, no. Ahoj, ve zvoru, nikdo tam není, že jo? But that's smart because then you can actually hear it. <laughs> Yeah, or use the telephone. <laughs> now that telephone, would that also talk to the bunker up, yeah. up there? Yeah. Uh -huh. so, it, it's by this... Uh, so with the cupola. Yeah. So, yes, but via this... Uh, yeah, go, go to this box. Uh, so anybody who got caught in the middle, got hung up on the wire, they would be caught with these machine guns and the machine guns up there. I love that, I love that it's here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just... Mm. It's reinforced without the rivets. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, it. Yeah. And then, of course, you had the, the last minute. 
yeah. firing position yeah. inside yeah. the door. Just for, yeah. it's, 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 that is just like a typical German design, really, with a sliding port. Ooh, it clicks in too. Pretty much only look in one direction, though. There's no real, no, not really any looking around. This is the diamond pit uh, below this. Yes. One. Yeah. So yeah. this is the watch. watch the air air ventilation. Yes. yes there it is. Yes. That's the kitchen. Yes. <laughs> is that it? Yeah. That's the, really the, there it. Is a, there is a cooker. To burn a petroleum for, for this uh, petroleum. But when they were stationed here, people would bring them food in peacetime. Oh, by this, yes. from November to Nadmeto, there was a like kasarna, place where the soldiers live. So yeah. they also cans. Is so you could gas see or that oil? Uh, pe petroleum, oil, yeah. Oil. Yeah. 38, 32 people? Yes. Tell me about your candidate. One, one, 173, I think. 73? What number? 173. So they came off the production line, Skodavak, 173. Aha, so it was in, installed in 1938. Then it was taken away to the storage uh, place in uh, Škodovka, in Škoda Plzeň. And uh, then the Germans took it in 1939 to the Atlantic. It did what? Did it what? Atlantic Wall, Norway or France? Norway. Norway. So this poor thing went all the way from here to well, came from Skoda, went to here, went back to Skoda, uh -huh. went to Norway, and then it came back here. Yes. That's a hell of a trip. And it works. How did you get it in Norway? How did it come back? So uh, we used to have a friend in uh, Norway, living in Norway, and uh, they were touring uh, the Norwegian museums, military museums, and uh, they find, found out that uh, there is a Czechoslovak cannon uh, on one of them. So they asked. You didn't look for it. No, it was it just was literally by accident. By accident. Yes. And, and then they found out that it belonged here. And uh, then uh, they started uh, like negotiating if uh, there are more of them. And in case, the, so they found out there are more of them, but in terrible state, let's say. So they started negotiating if it wouldn't be possible to get uh, one of the cannons back to the Czech Republic. And uh, they were looking through the archives and they found out uh, that, according to the number, uh, one of the cannons that are there uh, in Norway, Norway uh, so it, one of them belonged here and uh, the other one belonged to Toulon, which is the other bunker up the hill. So did they get theirs back too? And uh, this was actually the... Uh, good reason or one of the reasons why they said yes, okay, we will let you have your cannon back. I'm, I'm just curious, did you pay for it? Neplatil se za to, že ne, asi. Exchange. Jo, it was an exchange for some other things that can be, could be at that time easily found here, but not in Norway. You didn't find anything Norwegian here, did you? Uh, no, <laughs> no, it was some, uh, like, uh, <laughs> and the optics are here. Yes. The supports here. It's operated by what? Three men: a gunner, six. a loader, and a an six. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. 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 six. Yeah. So you okay? Six. So you had uh, the one, one uh, for for the cannon. One who was shooting uh, with this uh, heavy machine gun, which is oh, so there's a the heavy top. machine gun built yes. on it. Yeah. Yes. 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 And then you had two loaders? Yeah. Uh, Kolik bylo na VHU? Že to nabíjel, 
a další tady brali a dávali mu to do ruky. Yeah, and they were just forwarding the, the ammunition to the loader. So two loaders, a machine gunner, and a gunner. Yeah. Where's the last guy? A ten ten poslední to řídil. Šestý byl velitel těla. Jo, he was the commander of the. A ten byl velitel. Okay. Yeah. Pozorovatel, bažoval se na střelce, jak má mířit. He was telling. I I have never in any of the fortresses seen that whole setup complete. Aha. I that I think that is really really cool. Three centimeter away, one fish. Aha. Now you're a kilometer. Aha. So if you shoot from one kilometer distance, you can. It it penetrates three centimeters thick. Anti tank. And then you had an explosive as well. An explosive. You got the spare barrel with it as well. Máme tady taky. Sorry. You got the spare barrel as well. Yes. You gotta love the Norwegians sometimes. And one of my favorite things in the world is when bunkers and forts and cannons and weaponry are reunited. One thing is we have a bunch of really enthusiastic, great people out here that's been working for 30 years restoring this fort to the way it was. When they start finding and trading, get the original weaponry here, I'm really impressed. You can see the lights. Look at the door. 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 I love it when things work so I can just push them around with one hand. That's just awesome. What museum in Norway did you find it? What museum? It's a museum. 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 And when you got the cannon back, they all came with all the tools. Yes. And you can see that there is check. And uh, when Germans took it uh, for themselves, so uh, they had to uh, write uh, the, the explanation. They rewrote it in German on there. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. And this is a what is this? A thirty-seven? Uh, what is this? Forty-seven? Uh, the, the cannon. Yeah. Yeah, you can see four point seven. This is a cannon that had a long, interesting story. Yes, that's true. It's, it's really good to see that you've got, not only got the cannon back, you've got all the accessories back. Yeah. With the two. So are the, the, what, what you repainted in is also the original colors. That's not true. Almost. Yeah. We tried to. I'm visiting three of these forts that are literally sitting on a line like pearls on a string where from each fort you can see the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Although now you have forest in the way, so I will make my way up the hill, down the valley, and show you exactly how this was. But at the time of the war, these would be mutually defending, and easily to see and spot each other, also for communication. It's another fighting position right up from the first one we saw down there. And this string of fortifications continues all the way up over the hill. Even in France, I don't think I've seen a place with forts this densely packed. Now you see a very interesting casemate here, sitting a little higher up in the woods. Fighting position with a few machine gun domes. And you can see the machine gun dome well was demolished. After the Germans occupied it, a lot of the weaponry, cannons, domes, steel domes, turrets, machine guns, were used for the Atlantic Wall fortification. And you can see how they blew up the sides of this to retrieve the dome from here. Likewise on the other side, you have machine gun positions over the moat, as is nicely, authentically, encased in barbed wire. Machine guns, I am imagining there would also have been a... There probably would have been some sort of lighting, but I'm not entirely sure. Cannon and machine gun, or two machine guns. There could have been a projector, but I don't see anything that's big enough for that. I see drainage into the moat. 
I'm wondering if there was projectors here. I'm about to find out. And then you have on the other side another missing machine gun dome that was again taken by the Germans after 1939. And you have a moat that is nicely encased in barbed wire, very authentic machine guns. And there's a larger position. So that would have been for an anti-tank cannon or one of the there's an anti-tank cannon with machine gun. It's one of those very interesting nacelles that has both anti-tank cannon and machine guns in it. We saw them at Fort Sackleberg, and I've seen some experimental at the Maginot Line. Now remember, this was built after the Maginot Line was built and designed. And the dome would have been much higher up of course, than the cement encasement that they've put in place here. Either to stabilize the cement or symbolize that used to be a dome, there's ventilation there, but it would have come all the way up to the top edge of the cement there. Of course, you have the entanglements for camouflage netting and so forth. When you come from here, and you look straight down the path, you have the other, the next position right down here. Of course, all these trees would have been gone. There would have been no trees anywhere near here. And another machine gun position, that's right here in front of the door. Same as with the French, you have the barbed wire door in front of the machine gun that would be locked. Of course, these had to be given up without a fight. Right. So, you have an office. <laughs> it's a long walk. We have a nice little, all right, what do we got? They put this up nicely. So here we have what's left of the nacelle from outside, from the machine gun nacelle, the three holes. We have, I have a machine gun model 1397. Oh yeah, there are the labels in, in English, so. <laughs> uh, then we have the tail of a heavy mortar, then we have a small little, uh, what is that, an 80 millimeter? And then we have a, what, a 37, what the hell is that, 37? 20, what is that? I'm is not that? sure, but you know, wait them. <laughs> we have a little bit of... And this is a bayonet from a Mauser. Looks like a Mauser bayonet. Which one do you mean? It looks like a Mauser bayonet. Yo, 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 it's the same one as, as in the dormitory. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's for, for a mouse. Is that for a mouser? Or is that for the Czech? Uh, Czech, Czech, Czech one. Yeah, but. I ale mean, je to asi nějaké jako. No, má to asi něco společného s mauserem, ne? Že to byla nějaká inspirace. Je to je mauser. Jo. Freshly, je to je mauser. Je to. I thought I recognized it. I had a few. So you can do like those. And this you found out in the field. That's. That's for the machine gun? For the heavy machine uh, yes, gun? For, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's nice. <laughs> Just the, the, that would have then been in this hole with the casings rolling down here. That looks like German? Czech? Aha, so to Nemecky, Czechy, or something like that? Czechy, but civil. Aha, so it's uh, for civilians. So they. Not military ones. Made in Czech, yeah, or made in German? Made in Czech. Made in Czech. Is this where the water pump should be? So this is uh, how uh, yeah. the small bunkers could be used or were used. Yeah. Well, no, no, it's uh, the shoots or... Um, this is a Richling. This is a Richling. Yeah. Holy yeah. fuck. <laughs> I know exactly what this is. They tested them here. Yeah. Like, like not here in Lom, this is called Lom, this place, but... Uh, they tested them up there? Yes. Yeah. That's why they're so carved up, because they tested them with the Richling. Yeah, and yeah. you could even see the uh, remain of uh, this. 
in the world. I did not know they did that. Yeah. That's a serious piece of kit. When did, when did they do that? Could it be like 1941, 42? What is that? I think that the it's... Fat uh, the, 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 the uh -huh. So it's uh, the, the antique from concrete. The, uh, German. German. Was it 210 millimeter? What is that? Yeah. But honestly, when I look at this whole area of fortifications, this fortified line was really something else. This is such a densely packed line of forts, like pearls on a string. I haven't even in France at the Maginot Line seen an area that was this densely packed with fortifications of interlocking fields of fire. They can all keep an eye on each other. They have all the approach routes uh, covered by anti-tank weaponry, machine guns. There's artillery forts behind me. This is very well thought out. This is a very, very heavily defended area. They lead all the way down through town and up on the other side of the hill. And all the way down the hill to the next bunker. You had steel pillars sunken into the ground, encased in cement and concrete, wrapped in barbed wire so nobody could sneak through. And even if they were to, they would be hung up right here where they would be in right be fired upon by both machine guns and anti-tank cannons from both directions. Very well thought out. Of course, when you come down in the valley and see the other fort down here, and then you continue the line up on that ridge, it's another one. It is just one continuous line of forts. And there's just a wonderful group of volunteers taking care of them. It's really interesting, you can see here where the ventilation is open when the grate is off you can see where the four ventilation shafts are coming from from the two domes from the machine room from the firing positions what remains of the well and here you see the back protecting the bunker leading up to the dome that is no more and a very well protected and a very well camouflaged roof and the other dome they made. It was called original World War II. That's how the Germans left it. And after our interpreter left and a little back and forth haggling, we both realized that we sorta of could communicate in German. So the tour kept going. And I love this guy. And it probably lost some of the firing embracers as well. And I'm thinking it's more likely that these were lost to the Germans than to scrappers. So. It's a nice little office. A lot of cold air. So. I had no idea the collection they put up in the museum down here. It's just amazing. 
Now you guys always ask and wonder where did all this stuff go? Well, it's sitting around in museums like this. Under periscopes went. Not all the museums around the world where these things ended fortunately on display and nicely protected. And this is one of those places. And the most perishable of most World War II memorabilia is probably the uniforms. Whereas the weapons are metal and they'll last a little longer. These are hard to get. Czechoslovakia into broke with British. In the Czech Republic. In the Czech Republic, yeah. With the uh, Englander. The yeah. the free Czech. Yeah. Yeah. And the underground Czech. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here is the Brunner in this room. There is the Brunner. And not for this pump. Yeah. But ehrlich? Yeah. Ah. That's really cool. Different pump. And here's the ground. Well, we are down the mountain, so we are a little bit lower. Hier is uh, de Brunner niet tief, maar het was 4 meter. Hier zijn we zien bij, bij de Plus. <laughs> ja, so we're down here in the center of the mountain, so the well is only 4 meters deep. So you have a good old fashioned blue well pump. Okay. Ja, ja, oh, dat ziet man. Ja, ja. We hebben quite a bit of a collection of original arms, and now I understand why there's a serious uh, security. Uh, since 16, 27, 9 mil, 1938. Maxim, mm -hmm. 1901. Nine. Uh, 1907. Yeah. Czechoslovakian machine but original is uh, Schwarzlose. Ja, Schwarzlose. Ja, ja, ja. Ich habe Dokumentar von Schwarzlose gemacht. You guys remember the documentary I did on heavy machine guns? Well, here they are. And here they are in pieces. Wow, I love this. I absolutely love what they've done here. And all of them are original. That's just amazing. And this is what it looks like when you have a dome that got violently blown up from the inside. Oh, this is so sad. And of course, we filled it up for a very good reason. And I'm now going to continue on the other side of the hill where they were testing the Rüschling shell on some of these bunkers. Let's see if you know how this goes. We have a stunning, beautiful view over a valley. And then behind us, we have a piece of cement with rebar sticking out of it. You know how this song goes. Alright, so granted, this was not the biggest fortification in the world. It's been shot at. It's been made with heavy rebar. Very heavy rebar, in fact. Very, very heavy rebar and it has disassembled itself without a whole lot of grace. But it is overlooking this 
beautiful valley here, leading me to think this was once an observation post of some sorts to maybe a machine gun bunker, nothing bigger. The larger forts are a little bit further in on the hilltop. The anti-tank barriers that we see the Germans predominantly make in metal and you see a lot of them. Made me wonder how well they're reinforced inside. It seems, from what I can see, that they're held together only by a single thread of rebar. Just an observation. I would think that would really not be enough. Leading away from that position, we see more and more leading up to a fort sitting up there on top of that hill. And you have the first fortification here, and the next one is up there. And I can see it is covered in scaffolding, which to me is one of the most beautiful things I've seen in a long time. More anti-tank obstacles, barbed wire entanglements. This looks very familiar, doesn't it? In fact, this looks exactly like an area that is being preserved for history, doesn't it? Now will you look at what's going on there? Scaffolding surrounding an old bunker. A museum being built. That can only mean one thing. Restoration. Protection of history. We must find these people and buy them a drink. They are restoring this. You would have cannon positions here in the wall. As we've seen this, almost identical in the French heavy measure-lined artillery positions, like Hackenberg. This looks like they are completely restoring this to look just like new. I have here a machine gun port overlooking the moat here so nobody could sneak up and put explosives right in front of the positions. I do so hope they have the cannons as well. Now if ever there's one thing that makes me happy as a historian it's seeing scaffolding outside old era World War II, pre-World War II bunkers, fortifications these things are being restored to look like they did back in the day. And I don't know if this is because of volunteers or they got a grant, but this is amazing to see. This means somebody cares about history as much as we do. What a gorgeous restoration it is. What a gorgeous view it is. And they even started working on the close defensive perimeter of this fort. And up there on the hill, you already have the next position overlooking this one. The other one down there, one in the woods. You have this beautiful view. It's a string of interconnected forts. And from what I'm seeing, there's also tunnels connecting these. Now here's a casemate that's been hit hard. And it's surrounded by scaffolding and bags of cement. <laughs> Unless they're worried the Germans are coming back. I'm seeing restoration and protection work. One of my most favorite things in the world to see is restoration of historical forts and bunkers. This is amazing. Somebody's actually doing something. Now I will say, 
if you look at the holes the, and the damage this thing has suffered. In the end, these great forts and bunkers were never tested in battle. They were, however, tested by one of the Germans' most advanced projectiles, the Ruschling shell. And here they were storing these bunkers also, but sadly the Russian shell damage had been plastered over. You can still see how deep the craters are, but I would have preferred them to be left exposed for us to see, as it is an important part of history, just like we saw in Fort Orba. See the whole facade has been gouged out with artillery weaponry shots. Looks like direct fire. And here, on the roof, overlooking one of the positions, you see the next fort down there in the distance. Restoration of a dome. With a fort down there and a beautiful view. You see more, all these domes encased from the back. So they should only fire one position one direction generally overlooking the artillery fort down there so you're definitely looking at interlocking fields of fire overlooking valleys mutually supporting positions of large fortifications Behind me is also artillery fort. They are doing an active restoration of all the forts in this area. No idea who's paying for this or if it's all volunteers, but I think it is absolutely fantastic to see some of these positions being actively restored and worked on after so many years of decay. That is just gorgeous. And you see the, I guess the nacelle. I keep thinking they shouldn't be sitting out here because somebody might steal it, although it probably weighs about a ton. It would be identical to the one sitting in there. You have the machine gun positions, dual machine guns, cannon, machine gun. Where they've been so kind to put in the stairs to the little door there. This looks very much like a late generation National Line forts, the small and more compact forts. But of course, they were to some degree a modernization and upgrade of National Line fortresses. It is just amazing to see them being restored. We have to talk to the people doing this because that is uh, the most beautiful thing I've seen is scaffolding around an old bunker position. That is just outstanding. That truly is outstanding. Here on the other side, you have another moat. Although one moat. You think it's no, it's actually covered fairly well. You have a machine gun position there, and you have a cannon position there. One that I could get my way in through, because it's not sealed off, which it probably should be. But I will absolutely not disrespect the people who are storing this by doing such a thing without permission. Now in the end, due to a lot of political wrangling, the German army just marched into Austria, with church bells ringing, millions of people cheering behind marching bands, followed by Hitler and Himmler. And the same generally repeated itself after a long midnight meeting with the Czech President Benesch and Hitler. Benesch saw no way of avoiding a German occupation one way or another, and chose to peacefully allow the German soldiers to enter first the Sudeten territories and later the remainder of the country. And it was thus annexed. Both events with no shots fired, both without the Allies taking any action 
Indeed, they had tacitly put pressure on the Czech president to accept the handover of the Sudeten territories, leaving the rest of the country defenseless. But even the Polish took a part of Czechoslovakia in 1938. The bunkers here were not used by the Soviets or the Czech army after the war, but recently a lot of small efforts have begun to restore them. And all of historians, we all praise this effort and can't wait for more visits. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebmus nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, uh, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.